Hello, testing, testing. How's it going? I had to reboot. Um, can anybody hear me? I hope they can. Connecting. Oh, is this today? Uh oh. Mm, that looks alive. Okay, good. Let's wait. Bug. Where is the thing? All right. Oh, somebody can hear me. Good. All right. Good. Thanks, guys. And now we'll try the video and see if that goes. No one can see you. No one can see your screen. Maybe this will work. All this sophisticated technology at our disposal. It's kind of amazing, actually, isn't it? And can you see the screen yet? Let me know. Ah, da, da. Oh, for God's sakes. Wow. I'm trying to put Bloomberg on my screen, but it's not working. Anyway, so da, da, we got visuals. Visuals seem to be working. Good job, everybody. We are ready to go. I'm going to do a little voiceover and we'll get ready. Hang on. Access to this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. Consult a licensed broker or registered investment advisor before placing any trades. All securities and orders discussed are tracked and monitored in virtual trading accounts. Virtual account prices and returns may differ from actual trading results. Commission costs are excluded. Neither Philstockworld.com, PSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of their respective officers, personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors are in such capacities licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, or registered broker dealers. Nothing contained in this webinar, website, or promotional material constitutes a promotion, recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment, security, or transaction. Trading options involves risk. Visit the AUK website, www.optionsclearing.com, to read characteristics and risks of standardized options. PSW provides education and training services that are meant to teach you the risks and potential rewards of trading options, and we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying or guarantee any profit. As always, do not trade with money that you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results, and the results discussed in this webinar are not typical and are only valid on that specific or identified date. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless from any loss as you may incur as a result of information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously and we will not distribute or sell your information to anyone. All right, fantastic. Now we are up to date and rolling and everything seems good except all right, no, that's all fine. How are things looking? Is that today? Can't be today. This is last week. Great. All right. So that's not working. That's something's wrong with that one. New tab. Okay, not gonna worry about that yet. Still gotta clean up this browser. I think we're running out of space on this machine. Anywho, so what's going on today? Um, go to the futures charts. It's easier to look at at the moment. So everything is everything is awesome again as usual. Dow's up 32, but the Nasdaq is up 184 points, almost at 12,000. Now we started the morning off. I wanted to short it. That did not work out on the first pass, but we're going to give it another shot very shortly. Um, and we talked about how to short it. Oh, how the oil come out? That's another thing you're looking at. So let's take a look over there and see how we're doing. Um, bu -bu 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 futures, energy. Nope, that's not going to tell us. An hour. Okay, so we had a pop. So we popped up here to 43. We we talked about shorting 43.50 was my target short. Now, now, of course, you know, as you know, I don't pull these numbers out of my ass. That's the five percent rule. So we know what we expected. So in the morning when I was saying, 
4350 is a good line to short oil. That was back at 830 or a little before 830 when I was writing that. And if you look at the daily chart for oil, okay, so we topped out, you know, when I was writing this, it was about 830 or so, so we were below the line. We went above 4350. And, and again, when I say the line that should be the support on the 5% rule, it doesn't matter that it goes over it. What matters is what happens after that. We want to short things after they cross back under. So, you know, we start shorting here at 43, you know, when it's 43.50 and we see it go up here, if it cross back seriously under that refinement, you could, you could try it here and stop out if it comes back over. But then the next time it comes over, we try it again and it comes back under. And now we got a good short. And 43.20 is already $300 per contract on that one. Then it goes up again, 43.50, boom, another short, 43.30, then 43.30 again. That's how you make your money. You got to know your spots, and you got to and you got to play it the right way. Now you can kind of, well, you can't see. That's the thing. That's where the five percent rule is more useful than 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 you know eyeballing things. So on a chart, you can't tell the forty three fifty line is going to be the the where it's going to stop. But on the five percent rule, we can calculate it out. And um, so that's there. Or and Brent topped out right at forty six. Gasoline also spiked. Wow, look at this spike in gasoline. Holy crap! So gasoline spiked up and now it's way back down. Of course, we have the holiday coming. So there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, a positive pressure on gasoline. What on earth is this? I'm sorry, my TV is like got a weird black and white thing. It's just not working out. What? On, that's so weird. One, nope. Two, two, two. No. Oh, wow. What is my TV doing? I think my cable box needs to be rebooted. Anyhow, um, what was I saying? So, you know, we have the, the, the holiday is not this weekend, it's next weekend. So, basically, there's the three day holiday. It's technically a high demand time for gasoline, but nothing is a high demand right now. Um, but still, people are going to play it. There won't be a lot of resistance to the downside. So we'll probably be keep hitting around this, these lines, especially for oil. You're going to see 43.50 a lot, I think. But on the whole, you know, 42.50 is a more realistic price for oil, and maybe even 40. So you know, we're going to be in, we're going to go into that lower end of the range. That's why this morning I talked about um, how we can short oil. So aside from the the short on actual oil. I think my whole internet is slow right now. That is my impression. So instead of um, because we have the hour and there's a hurricane going into the Gulf, that's also supporting. So then, depending every day on how much it moves and so on and so forth. That, by the way, is a good thing to do. It's like if you go to, um, let's say, AccuWeather. And then we go to the, this, they usually have some sort of special hurricane tracker. There you go. Oh, great. Thanks, AccuWeather. Very unhelpful. Catastrophic storm surge of 20 feet. Wow. Of course, don't they kind of always do that? Storm surge, that's nasty though. Where is that? That's New or this is New Orleans a little bit. That's, I mean, that's horrifying. That whole that whole coastal area over there is going to be hit with a massive 20-foot waves. So here's the one that we're worried about. And I guess you can hit play, and we'll see what happens. I don't know how good you guys can see it when I hit play. It's always nice and slow, so maybe. So it's, it's zooming along now. Oh, it's just like exactly the wrong kind of hurricane for this. It's coming right into the coast. It pushes a wall of water ahead of it. And it whacks into the into the coast with it with you know bring the water with it. Um, that's how hurricanes work. They suck up incredible amounts of water and carry them along. Um, wow, and we're having such nice weather too. See, I'm over here. We're having very lovely weather. <laughs> Mid dust. We never never had any effect from this thing. Um, 
And this is an L storm. This is Laura, I think. Uh, excuse me. Uh, so this is Laura. That means we're like halfway through the season. Uh, you don't really get past R R S. Not usually. You don't usually get past that anyway. So basically, we're at the halfway point. Um, we're towards the end, actually, a little bit, a little bit past the halfway point on the hurricane season. Um, but as you can see, it's a big storm. It's actually moving the clouds over this way, moving the clouds over this way. So it's a big, powerful storm coming through, heading out here, and ran right through the Gulf. So they shut down all the oil rigs and all the gasoline rigs. Now, of course, we're not we're not drilling much. So the that's another thing, by the way. They love to shut down the rigs. It gives them an excuse to shut production. Like, you know, the U.S. the U.S. companies can't just shut production like OPEC does, but they can use any excuse to shut down production and lower the supply. So they love it when there's a storm. They, they immediately, like two days before, clear out the rigs and get the workers off. Even if it's like a breeze, they like to shut down production. So they raise the prices. You know, so that, that's the way they run it. Um, But this is not going to have as big of an effect because if we have very little effect. We'll see that on the EIA report. August 21st. Yeah, that's a rare one. Okay, so oil imports 5.9 barrels a day. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Crude inventories decreased by 4.7 million barrels. And that makes sense because they are drawing down the crude to make more gasoline. Gasoline inventories decreased by 4.6 million barrels because people go and fill up their tanks ahead of the holidays. That also happens all the time. And dissolute fuels increased by 1.4 million barrels. Something had to increase with all this production. And um, on the whole, we went from 95 to 85, though. So that's good. We had a draw. We had a draw. No, oh, no. Well, wow, okay, so it's like a 10 million barrel total draw, went from 2095 to 2085. So that's a good, healthy draw. It's supportive of oil. Um, notice our exports jumped by 100,000 a day, but that's not terribly high. And um, everything else seems pretty normal. I mean, just compare the bottom line numbers, see if there's any big changes. So no big change there. 10 million draw of air. Uh, a little bit more exporting, but not that much. Although the export number is incredible. We're exporting 21 million barrels a week. That's more than one day's production of the U.S. is exported. Um, and pricing is whatever. See, pricing is really low compared to last year. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of easy ways to push it up. 167 versus 127 gasoline. So it's, 20, you know, it's like 20-something percent off on the gasoline. Um, so on the whole, you know, th this is not a, a weak report, but as you can see, it, it also isn't strong enough to keep oil where it was. Um, and we'll, we'll just have to wait and see what happens next, frankly. Where are we? Uh, T-shirts, right? Okay. So if we go back to last year, look, we were way in the 60s, but even so, even in the 60s, when you're at the end of August, this is the holiday time, right? See, so we had a disappointing holiday demand last year. We dropped off. That's why it's kind of a fun bet, you know, to see if oil, to see if oil drops off a little bit. But I like the future short here. We'll, you know, we do 43.50. We hope for a nice little one dollar drop. Pick up a thousand dollars per contract. But meanwhile, if you get 500 per contract on no news, take it off the table. Why would you let something ride if you if you make this kind of money if you're going to go on like from 4350 from this line to 4320 is 300 bucks I mean probably didn't hit it on the head but here you're making 250 dollars you know that 43 is going to be supported so making 500 dollars per contract is really the most you're going to hope for without a, without a significant bounce off that line so if the most you're going to get is 500 dollars and you get 250 dollars then take it. If you get 250 quickly and all you could possibly get is five, that's the bird in the hands worth two in the bush. You got to learn to take those things off the table when you get them. And all right, one more time, I'm going to try to get the thing on my TV because it's really driving me nuts. I got to tell you, it's just very strange. And if not, I'm going to reboot it. One, two, two, two is 
Bloomberg. Oh, wait, this one might work. There's Bloomberg. And no picture. That's crazy. It's so weird. It's showing me the it's showing me the text, uh, the closed caption text, but it's not showing me the actual screen. I'm just seeing closed caption text and no picture. That's two different channels. I don't really know what to do about that. I'm going to reboot the thing and hope that that does something. All right. See what happens now. Diane Harrington says the audio is muted. Hmm. I don't know what to do about that. Um, let's see. Uh, whoops. Sorry. I'm like, no idea what to do. Check in the All right, so I don't know if anybody else has this problem, but um, but Diane said that she uh, clicked on the webinar and it was muted, and she tried to toggle a switch. I don't even know what switch she's talking about, though, unfortunately. I don't know what that means. Okay, uh, any thoughts, uh, JC's asking, any thought on how much more upside we might see in UNG and NG during the hurricane season? Ah, that's a good question, right on topic and everything. Um, I think that UNG had a really good run, so I'm not really looking for it to like fly higher. Um, obviously, if there's something prolonged, but it, but it goes back to, oh, I'm sorry, it's the same thing I was, I was trying to talk about a minute ago. Um, the, yes, hurricanes shut down production in the Gulf of Mexico, but we haven't been doing a lot of drilling in the Gulf of Mexico because that's our most expensive place to get oil from. And since oil is currently cheap at $43, um, the rigs that generally operate in the in the 50 plus range uh, are not profitable. So they have already shut down a huge amount of that production. Therefore, the effect of the hurricane is much less significant not to mention the fact that demand is significantly lower. So um, uh, if, you, if you think about, it, okay, like, um, you know, let, let's say uh, pumpkins, right? You know, there's, a, there's pumpkin season when people buy pumpkins. So pumpkins during pumpkin season are, I don't even know, $10. Like, so let's say for a pumpkin is $10. But during the rest of the year, pumpkin is like five bucks or, or zero because nobody even wants a pumpkin the rest of the year. I mean, honestly, when do you when do you see pumpkins in the supermarket other than Halloween? Uh, then you're paying ten bucks for a, a, a big vegetable, um, a big a big I mean, un inedible vegetable too. It's really what do you, you, there's not much you can do with a pumpkin, frankly, as far as food. Um, uh, the seeds are good, but I don't think the actual the rest of the, the rest of the thing isn't very tasty. Um, and I know I'm sure somebody likes pumpkin pie or something, but. Yeah. Anyway, um, and pumpkin spice lattes, of course. I don't know what part of the pumpkin goes into a pumpkin spice latte, but very smart of Starbucks to figure out a use for it. Um, let's see. So what was I saying? That's who that's right. So anyway, all right. So in the Gulf of Mexico, we have um, a lot less rigs being used now than usual. So therefore, you don't have that effect. And... Um, and oh yeah, and, and and like I was saying, there's a demand for things. So in other words, if you have, um, you know, there's there's in my town there's ten thousand people. So there's ten thousand people in my town, and the grocery store has ten thousand pumpkins. That's adequate for demand. Therefore, the price of the pumpkin stays around ten bucks even during Halloween, right? The rest of the year, if they had ten thousand pumpkins, they wouldn't be able to give it away, which is exactly what happened to oil. Um, 
not count here. Here. Well, no, no, that's not long-term enough days. Okay, there. So that's what happened to oil here. They had all this oil, yet we all stopped driving and stopped going out, and all of a sudden there was more oil, and they, they couldn't give it away. It actually went negative one day. Remember, there was a, the, this day, I guess, it went actually negative during the futures because they literally couldn't give the April contracts away, and people were terrified they were going to be stuck with the oil in May. So they were trying to dump these contracts um, to just get rid of them. They didn't want to even pay the money to take the contracts or to have them, which is crazy. Um, so oil actually went negative for a bit. Uh, so, so like I said, so so now let's say during, you know, there's 10,000 pumpkins for 10,000 homes in my town. And they're $10 each. Let's say that for some reason, something disrupts the pumpkin supply in my town. And now the supermarket only has 9,000 pumpkins. Okay, if all 10,000 people wanted a pumpkin, you would be short and people would start bidding on pumpkins to make sure they didn't miss out <clears throat> and the price of pumpkins would rise. But what if only 8,000 people actually want to buy pumpkins? That, that does not affect, even though the same, even though you say, oh, it's Halloween and oh, we have a shortage of pumpkins and usually we have 10,000 and now we have 9,000. But yeah, usually you have 10,000, that's exactly enough. Now you have 9,000, but you know what? That's fine because, because a lot of people don't feel like doing pumpkins this year. So you still have more than enough. Just because you have less doesn't mean you don't have enough. All right, so just because there's a supply disruption and just because there's a holiday, if it boosts demand by because of the holiday, but you're not boosting the demand high enough to meet the supply, even if the supply at the same time is being lowered, you still have 9,000 pumpkins to 8,000 people who want them. So you have not caused a shortage. You haven't, you're not experiencing a problem. There's no gap that needs to be filled. Um, so, so that's, so that you see you know, these suppositions, I know it's sticky in your head and it makes perfect sense. And you say, I don't understand how come there's only 9,000 pumpkins yet the price of the pumpkins is still $10. Why, why wouldn't it be more? Because it's not the only factor. And, and the same thing goes for, I don't understand why, why um, you know, why the, why the people are demanding more pumpkins, like people want more pumpkins on, the, on Halloween. So why aren't the price of pumpkins going up? Because you got enough freaking pumpkins. It's the only time of year you get to sell the stupid things. If it wasn't for Halloween, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't need any pumpkin. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> which is really an interesting concept, right? We have this whole thing we, that we grow, which we don't even eat, and we uh, and we just carve them up and then throw them away. <laughs> or we don't throw them away, and then they're like disgusting on somebody's porch like a month later. But either way, oh, that did the trick. My TV's working now. I had to reboot. You control all to leave. You young kids don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> so as old times, we just go oh, control of delete. Whatever, whatever goes wrong, just restart the damn thing. Um. Anyway, so oil. So 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 you know you have it fixed in your head that it's a holiday. There's going to be more oil, or there's a hurricane. It's hurt demand. Yeah, but that's not the only factor. You got to look at the overall picture, and the overall picture is we are not using oil, folks. We we've got a tremendous disuse of oil going on right now in this country so none of those rules apply so therefore because oil went from 42 43 during the month of august and i'm looking at 43.50 and saying yeah i'm not buying it that's too much doesn't seem like too much but it is too much 43.50 is too much and um and so that's where we're drawing a line in the sand and we think it's going to stop there and we think it's going to go back to 40 and then below 40 it would be back, back to um 28.50 so i'm sorry 38.50 so 38.50 would be the next line of resistance below that and that's that's kind of the range i think we're going to play out into in the fall and here you go like what happened here you had uh the, the holiday weekend it was a bust then for whatever reason i don't know why we popped here but then you said this slow drift down so how do we play it this morning? I said, well, let's short, let's short oil into April. Why? Because I want to capture this spot. I want to capture the post-holiday blues. Because if nothing else, if we go through the if we go through Christmas, let, let's say back to school isn't a total disaster, which I think it will be. Let's say 
Christmas seems a little perkier and we come back up a little bit. I still think that starting next year, once the year rolls over, people are going to freak out and get out of oil. Not from this spot, I mean from here. People are going to start freaking out again and avoiding oil because God forbid this happens to them again. This like pretty much bankrupted like half the oil traders, this thing. So they're not going to want to get caught in that again. So if they don't see some spectacular improvements in, in the, the oil demand economy between now and Christmas, they're going to start bailing like crazy to make sure they're not overly invested in oil in the spring. And, and you know, we're going to have not only, you know, we're going to have Biden who's going to do more lockdowns theoretically in November. There's going to be Biden with more lockdowns. Um, they'll, they'll, there'll be restrictions and so on and so forth. We may have uh, uh, another round of, uh, of stimulus where people stay home and so on and so forth. And none of that is net. There's not, there's not really a lot of bright spots on the horizon. Not only that, though, but Biden's going to come in and, and it's going to be all about clean energy. We're going to go back to like the, you know, we're going to go back to like, let's try to fix the environment. I know it's crazy, but you know, that, that's where we're going to be. So let's try to fix the environment again. And, uh, <laughs> and it's going to be, um, uh, uh, people are going to start really looking down at like long-term energy demand and, and the situation. And it's going to be hard to get people to start speculating long-term in that. So we will see. Wow. I cannot believe the NASDAQ is crazy. This is crazy. Look at this thing. Unbelievable. Up 200. Not the Russell. Russell's down. We talked about that yesterday. You got to watch, you know, the broader index. And uh, none, of, none of these are broad. This is a 50 stock index. DAX is a kind of broad index. Um, but not that. You know, I'm not sure how many, but it's not, it's not bigger than the S&P, though. So, you know, you got uh, 30, 500, 100, 2,000. The 2,000 index does not look that exciting. It's, a, it's a, the, the 100 index that looks exciting. The 500 looks exciting. It's the same five stocks, though. You know, these guys, these two guys are powered by the same five stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, uh, you know, Am wait, I said Amazon, I don't know, somebody else. <laughs> but anyway, the trillion dollar companies. Um, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google. Maybe that's it. Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google. Oh, yeah. Okay, five. Um, so you know, you got the same companies driving everything up, and the rest of the the rest of it, which I did yesterday in the chat, not in the chat, the morning post. Whoa. Was that not yesterday? Maybe it's Monday. Boy, I had quite the educational week here talking about the, um, the macro view, huh? Yeah, it was. What do you know? Here you go. So, you know, these stocks are 35% of the gains. I'm sorry, these guys are up 35% without these stocks. You take those five out and the rest of the S&P is down 5%. The overall, you know, so, so in other words, without these five stocks, the whole rest of the S&P is down 5%. That makes sense. It makes sense that the whole S&P is down 5%, given the virus, given everything else that we know about the economy, that does make sense. But that means there's a couple of things it means. It means first of all, if you're if you're investing in the market and you don't have great returns, that might be why. Uh, if you're investing in these guys and you have great returns, that might be why. What's going on? And there's and there's a couple of other companies like that. I mean, you didn't take out Tesla, which has incredible returns for the year. Um, there are other stocks that are driving it, and and Tesla no longer can be ignored. It's got a 400 billion dollar market cap, and it just got upgraded today. So Tesla's got a $400 billion market cap. 
it is now getting towards the size of these guys, and the way it's going, it looks like it's going to keep come in the trillion dollar club. For you know, for what reason? Who the frick knows? It's just ridiculous. But it doesn't make it certainly it doesn't make it not happen. This is still a thing. Um, we just have to uh, pay attention to what's going on in the real market, not just sort of get caught up in all this uh, this fattest stuff that's going on with these guys. Now, it's not undeserved. Facebook makes good money. Apple makes good money. Microsoft makes good money. Google makes good money. They're all good companies. Google's a little expensive. Facebook's pretty expensive. But they kind of, you know, if, if you have to buy something, none of them are terrible. Tesla's terrible, of course, but none of these guys are terrible. Apple's probably still undervalued considering where it is. So it doesn't make them bad companies. It just means that they are pulling up the entire rest of the index, which is performing as you would expect the S&P to perform given the virus and situation. Now, those guys are kind of immune, right? Facebook, not affected. Facebook benefits from the virus. Everyone's home on Facebook. Amazon benefiting from the virus. Apple, not hurt by the virus. Certainly, they, you know, they've got nothing. Uh, they got Apple TV. That's good for Apple TV. It's good for Apple Music. You sit at home. You got nothing else to do. It's good for Apple devices because God knows you can't live without those right now. Um, there's nothing bad about the virus for Apple. Um, Google, obviously, also good for Google. What are we doing? We're sitting here on the TV. We're sitting here and searching. When I search for something, I look for Google. I just looked for something a minute ago, right? I just looked for that on Google. Everything's on Google, basically. You don't have a choice. Whenever you're looking something up, you're using Google. Um, and of course, Google makes ad money, right? Because here's Google, look, Google. Google makes money here. Google makes money here from State Farm. Google makes money. All these little, any little ads you see are generally put it put there by Google. Can we tell? I don't know if we can tell. Nope. But anyway, you know, they, they're they're the number one people who would do stuff like this. Like when you they put content sensitive advertising in your web pages, that's how they make their money. You know, and it's not, it's, you know, look, honestly, you talk about these things being evil, but they don't really do such a bad job. I mean, you go to, when you go to non-Google pages, you see the crap that's like all over the page. And uh, that I object to. This is like, okay. I don't know why they think I would want to look at a Ford, uh, whatever this is, a Ford Escape. But uh, I guess it looks kind of like my car. I mean, I get, I, yeah, maybe I, get, I guess there's some logic there. Don't forget, it's not Google's decision. It's really Ford's decision to say. They tell they tell Google, get find me people who have this kind of car and like this kind of shape, and hopefully they'll be looking for a new car and they'll say, oh, I there there's one I might get. So they know that my Porsche looks like that a bit, and uh, I, I guess they uh, if you're Ford, you might think that somebody's going to go from a Porsche to your <laughs> to your Escape, but I don't think it goes I don't think it goes that way that often. Um, Although with two girls, and maybe they also know I have two kids in college, so I might go from one to the other. <laughs> it's life is it's tough out there, let me tell you. Um, what else? Oh, look at this. Allergies low. That's nice. Allergies low. West Palm Beach, 88 degrees. All good. So that's, you know, so anyways, there's no reason those companies are going to make their money. And Amazon and uh, Google and Microsoft, of course, I'm using Microsoft now. See, all this stuff is funny, right? All these things that we're doing now. Those are the five stocks, five stocks you cannot live without, even in a crisis like this. Um, to some extent, doesn't that make them even more valuable though, right? Doesn't that, the fact that you could ride out an incredibly economic downturn with disastrous consequences for the for people and the environment and everything else, there's a horrible, horrible thing that's happened in the world and it doesn't affect those guys at all. In fact, for, for, for most of them, it's actually a benefit. But then, it, then it's inherent. It's incumbent upon us to say, okay, who else benefits from this kind of thing? Well, let's think about that. You got um, Verizon, right? Let's look at some bargains. Verizon, twelve times earnings. How are they hurt by a crisis like this? They're not. Okay, you've got AT and T. Uh, wait a minute. Wow, what is that? <laughs> okay, so for whatever reason, they have the P ratio of 18 to 92. I'll tell you, it is not actually 92. I don't know where they're coming up with that. 241 billion. Oh, that's Netflix. Oh, no, Netflix is 92. 
be. Now, you would say, okay, this thing should be good for Netflix. But remember, my theory on Netflix was that this crisis is not good for them because you are oversaturating Netflix. Too much Netflix. They're running out of content. What are they going to do? They're using up all the content that they promised you because Netflix is based on the concept that you're going to watch um, four or five hours a day tops of Netflix shows. But if you've got people staying at home watching 16, 16 20 hours of Netflix every day, 16 plus hours of Netflix at least, um, every single day without a break, without taking a day off, they chew up all the content that Netflix has to offer. My mother is watching um, Turkish soap operas, Turkish. She, like, for whatever reason, there's this hot thing now where, where people are watching these Turkish soap operas, and my mother's caught up in it. She watched the entire run of some soap opera of 200 episodes, which is horrifying when you think about how much time she spends sitting on a couch watching a show. But she was loving this Turkish soap opera. I came over to see her, and she's like, oh, watch this show. I'm like, this is awful. I don't understand why this is interesting to you. And it's only subtitles. You got to read the whole show. You can't even, you know, you can't, it's, it's just subtitles. It's crazy, but, I, you know, it's also interesting. It's like, I, I like the fact that, you know, it's like watching foreign films, right? We used to watch foreign films. Um, and we used to feel very sophisticated because we would read the subtitles and not talk to each other the whole time. We couldn't even look at our popcorn. Um, <laughs> so, that was back when I was a pretentious uh, college student, we used to do things like that. Um, so now my mother's watching foreign soap operas and, 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 and if you don't read the subtitles, no, they, they, there's nothing safe. The acting, it's just like an American soap opera. The acting's terrible. The story is terrible. I don't understand what she, what she sees in it, but it's a fad. Anyway, point being though, that's how desperate people are getting. They've seen everything else on Netflix. They're now watching Turkish soap operas. That is bad for Netflix over the long run. They're using up all their content. And I know you say, and I know you say, well, they have infinite content. They have blue and they have Turkish soap operas, but that's going to wear a little bit thin once people have other things that they can do besides Netflix. But nonetheless, Netflix doing very, very well. In fact, today, super duper well. Why are they doing so well today? Just to make me look silly. <laughs> I don't know what Netflix is doing today. Wow. Roku, Cuban. Oh, are they having their earnings? Past month, what's behind the fan rally? Uh, da -da -da -da. I don't see any particular reason Netflix is up 10% in a day. But it just shows you what's going on on the NASDAQ. I mean, just money is just pouring in and 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 jacking everything up. It's insane. Um, bu -bu 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 -bu. So that's where we are with that. Where were the questions? I feel. Oh, right. We we're going to talk about some of the stocks. So there's there's that Walgreens boots, which somebody was just telling me, like, oh, they're they're dog in the Dow, blah blah blah. Oh, can't get things right. WBA. The Walgreens to me is a stock that people should be owning ridiculously low right now. Um, and again, you wonder where these things come from. It's like, okay, so they've got um, a $33 billion valuation. And, you know, yes, they are making very little this, very, I'm sorry, they made $4 billion last year on a $33 billion valuation, $5 billion the year before, $4 billion the year before that. If you uh, quarterly, okay? Quarterly, oh, what are they doing? Net income. So quarterly, they took a hit last quarter, but that's, it's a one-time thing. It's not, uh, it's not that their operation is costing that much money. They had restructuring charges and stuff. So really, they're still making their billion dollars a quarter, and you're still paying $33 billion for it, and people are treating them like they do have a 48 P. Why? Because the programs do that, because people don't read past the headlines. They don't really think about what's in a number. All right, what would, what would, what is it? You know, Walgreens Boots had a had a thing. They merged. They've done the doing restructuring. They're closing stores. They're doing all this stuff. And now you got hit by the virus, which wasn't good timing because they would have lost maybe a billion or half a billion dollars, but instead they lost one point seven billion. But it's going to pass. 
and you're still left with the same company with all their stores and all the people who pick up all their subscriptions and so on and so forth. None of that is really changing. And in fact, you can argue that they're pretty bulletproof comparatively. All right, forget that they didn't make money, but look at the quarterlies and what are they doing? They, by the way, it's per quarter. 34 billion per quarter, 34 billion, 34 billion, 35 billion, 34 billion. The money's still coming in. They will figure this part out. The money is still coming in. The operating income. See here, you can see where the problem is. What happened? They went from plus 12 to minus 1.8 operating income. Okay. The cost of revenue didn't go up much. This didn't go up much. The gross profit is what, well, the gross profit is what changed. They went from 28.3. They were down 1.2 billion in revenues due to the virus, of course. And look at the timing. They're not a normal quarter. Their quarter ends 531. So they captured the very height. They didn't capture the reopening. They captured the entire part that we were closed for the two months. So their quarter is more affected than most companies by the closing because they stopped the books at 531. And you'll, and you'll hear a hundred analysts telling you this and that and blah, 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 and all this bullshit. Not one of them will mention the fact, oh, well, you know, their quarter ends on 531. Therefore, they have two full months of lockdown in their quarter, unlike most companies who got a boost in June, which is traditionally the month that would be counted for the quarter. So most companies didn't get hit the way they got hit. Their, their quarter was entirely during lockdown. And that makes it 33% worse than most companies who managed to get out of it somewhat. Even though their revenue only took a 3% a hit during the quarter. They will adjust, they will survive, and they will do stuff. And I do know, here's the problem with Walgreens. <clears throat> if you've ever been into Walgreens, it's like a grocery store. It's, it's, it's a, you know, they've taken, um, like CVS is still mostly a drugstore. Walgreens is, is, is more like a grocery store. They've got aisles and they've got all kinds of candy and they've got this other stuff and they've got um uh you know knickknacks for the house i mean they got all kinds of things that that, that you wouldn't think really belong in a, in a drugstore um they got refrigerators with 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 food groceries you know milk things like that like a 7-eleven kind of thing they got too much going on and, and, and i'm sorry they don't have too much going on because they're using the model that Boots uses in England. Walgreens, WBA is Walgreens Boots Alliance. Boots is an English pharmacy, which is very grocery store-like. It's very, they've got a lot of stuff going on in Boots. Very successful model. People go there for everything. Dwayne Reed in New York, very, and Dwayne Reed is a Walgreens, part of Walgreens too. Dwayne Reed in New York, very grocery store-like. It's like a 7-Eleven with drugs. Um, and that, that's the model that they're moving these Walgreens stores to. And there's nothing wrong with that <laughs> unless you have a crisis in which nobody goes to your store. Then it's a problem. And you've got a lot of square footage and a lot of merchandise devoted to an empty store. So you have to understand why things are down and what's going on. Oh, speaking of things, how's IMAX doing? They're actually starting movies again in China. I mean, that's some pretty good numbers. Yeah, look at that, coming back. There's another one you can grab. Uh, I know I know. I always say IMAX, I'm always like IMAX, IMAX, I love IMAX, it's a great company. It's a ridiculous price, you're very lucky to get it down here. Um, they have in, in China, people are starting to go to the movies again, they're gonna start going in Europe soon, then they'll start going in America, then this thing will be back in the 20s, and you'll say, Phil, why didn't you bang the table more on IMAX? I get tired. It is exhausting talking about the same stocks over and over again. At least for me, anyway. It's, it's, I'm not. I know. I know. I know people like Kramer just like they'll repeat the same thing a hundred times and consider that content. But I just I don't like to go back on things. I like to go forward. So let's see. Um, all right. Uh, Jeff says, thoughts on the NYCB down here, the dividend play. We normally keep an eye on them, but they have been beaten down for good reason. Are people understanding the nature of their multifamily loans? Ah, uh, I, you know, New York Community Bank, you know, let's take a look at uh, Yahoo, not that one, that one. 
I like NYCB, but New York, New York got hit pretty hard. So uh, you know, they're they're very regional, obviously. And they don't actually make money. That's another problem with them. Uh, nope, that's not NYCB. NYCB. What's this PA step? I don't know that. Okay. I don't know if that's their proper thing. But um, they're 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 just in a bad place right now as far as that goes. And um, they're holding company for the bank. So wait, NYC. I don't know. Is that the right symbol? Anyhow, so bottom line is it's I'm sure it's gonna have the right numbers. They're not big, you're talking about a billion, you know, but but in this thing they, they make the okay money, but it's not cheap for a bank really, four point seven billion dollars. Um and they're regional and they're heavily affected by the virus and you've got the, the, the loan problem and the tenant problem so there are definitely issues with them i'm not sure i'd be jumping in um but but you know it's a good long-term plan i'm not sure how far how down are they overall well i don't know if this is going to work either the way this thing goes nycb Yeah, they're down a bit. I mean, on, yeah, I mean, I, I guess if they're coming back down, they're going to hang out down here. It's a good place to pick them up for a long term. But uh, it, it, nothing like I think is ridiculously undervalued. Do, do you expect to pull back in the S&P 500 in the future? Oh, yeah, I expect it every day. This, uh, this is, the, look, I mean, I think that it's not very safe to predict this sort of thing because look at what's happening. I mean, you know, the Nasdaq is up 1.5 percent this month today. That's crazy. So, uh, although I expect a pullback, we're certainly not getting it. Not even close. And um, I mean, I, you know, I I can't believe we can hit 2,000 on the Nasdaq 100 and not have a pullback. 2,000. We were at 7,000 in March. No, I'm sorry, it's not 2,000. It's 12, I mean 12,000, sorry, 12,000. But we were at 7,000 in March, so it's like, you know, five, five into seven, whatever the hell that number is. But um, that is a massive, massive increase. Let's see, five times um, 13 is like 75 something 80 about 80 percent up so you know i mean that's a little odd don't you think to go 80 percent higher in a few months i mean i understand we went off the bottom but even off the bottom even off even off here this is 20 percent higher than here it's 25 30 percent higher than here yeah it is one third 33 percent higher than, than this spot so nine thousand figure that was probably a normalish range going to this crisis and now we're 33 percent higher than that that's it's very hard to justify you know and, and again but it goes back to the fact you've got these billion these trillion dollar stocks that outweigh the entire index by a mile and they're pulling everything with it they're just going up and up and up and they're pulling everything with it and and, and i'm not saying there's a reason not to invest in them they're good stocks so it's not like they're crazy. It's not like they're all overvalued. This isn't like we're being, see the thing is in, uh, in 1999, we were being driven by uh, a, a tech bubble that valued Yahoo and stuff and things, you know, things that now, you could say that Yahoo could have been Google over time, but they never were. They just never became Google. They were just Yahoo. They were way overhyped, but they were being valued like, as if they were already successful and were Google, even you know, Google wasn't Google back then. But when Yahoo was trading for ridiculous amounts of money and was the top stock in the index, um, there was no way you could justify it, not in a million years. Google, you can justify. Apple, you can justify. Microsoft, you can justify. You can justify why they're trillion dollar companies. 
So it's not like the dot-com bubble. Just because you have tech stocks leading a rally doesn't make it like the dot-com bubble. It tells you that these tech stocks are the best stocks on the market. That's all. It just tells you these are the leading stocks. But as I said, the other, the other, the other 495 stocks are not even doing that well. So there are plenty of bargains to invest in, and we just have to think of the ones that we like that are worth doing. And as I said, you got, um, what the heck? Oh, wrong chart. So you've got like AT&T, and you've got things, then you, then you say, what else does well? well? Home Depot does well, but it's too expensive. We have it in the hedge fund. Um, restoration hardware. Also good, but too expensive. You have to think of the ones that aren't expensive that haven't gone up. You know, so so um, there's Macy's, of course, still really cheap, crazy cheap. Um, there's SKT, which I bang the table on weekly, I think. All right, so SKT is a very good one. Um, not a mainstream one though, but a, but a, but a good solid uh, stock to get. Um, there's other beaten down things. Is Wendy's is a pretty cheap. Oh no, they're not. Ah, I thought they were. Oh, this Cheesecake Factory cake. That's that's great. One of the best restaurant chains in America. And you can get it for for twenty five dollars down from forty five. You know. So, so you, and, and also today, uh, Jean Luc put up. Um, he had a chart, and let's talk about that actually. Oh, yeah, everybody forgets this. It's still happening in Africa, you know. It's like locusts everywhere, eating all the crops. <laughs> it's a whole giant crisis. And we, we, it, would be the big, it would be the most important thing going on in the world if it wasn't for all the other stuff going on in the world. It's causing chaos. But, you know, look, look what's happening. They can't even fit. You see the logos, right? In between the logos and more companies that went bankrupt, they just can't fit all the logos because too many companies. Papyrus, Art Band, Models, Roots, um, Aldo, Lucky Brand, um, Taylor Brand, uh, Steinmart's gone, Lord and Taylor's gone, Paper Store, Brooks Brothers, geez, GNC, who we used to like, is gone Tuesday morning, JC Penny, Neiman Marcus, wow, <laughs> true religion. This is like horrifying. Q1. So those are uh, retail bankruptcies just going on all over the place. Restaurant bankruptcies. Uh, two J's we have in one of my malls. Um, Chuck E. Cheese, obviously. We all know that one. Um, Fig and Olive. Don't even know who that is. California Pizza Kitchen. Oh, they had it together. They don't. Um, another pizza one. Oh, Bomb Pan. Oh, no. Really? Oh, I like that. Is that a bomb pan or is that something else? Oh, well, anyway. Oh, this bamboo? Ooh, no good. No, went to one of those. I wasn't happy about that. I'm a big sushi guy. Uh, food first. But this is, you know, this is meaningless compared to the other. But what I'm saying is Cheesecake Factory not going bankrupt, less competition. So I was in, in the mall where my Cheesecake Factory is. There is a 2J's and there's a California Pizza Kitchen. And there's a bamboo, in fact. So there's three, all three of these guys compete with my with Cheesecake Factory. My Cheesecake Factory is still there, but these competitors are gone. What happens? More people go to the Cheesecake Factory. Okay, maybe somebody else will come in there, but it takes them a while to build an audience, and so on and so forth. So on the whole, the surviving places win. Now, Cheesecake Factory obviously having a rough time, considering that their success is based on the fact that they were constantly packed. Yeah, I, 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 I have gone to many places in this country and eaten in cheesecake factories. And I'd say more often than not, you have to take a, a thing, a pager to get in line and wait. They're always busy. And um, I don't understand why anybody would not want to buy something like that. But they're, they're really good stock, always doing well. But anyway, so plenty of good companies to invest in, plenty of things we can do. We're moving to more cash. We're thinking there's going to be a pullback at some point, especially I'm worried about the back to school thing. I think that's a horrifying idea. Um, so I'm worried about that. There's the uncertainty of the election, which is unfortunately still a few months away. So we have the election uncertainty. 
We have the back to school uncertainty. We don't know how what's going to happen on the virus, although every single indication we have so far is bad. Every school that's open has had problems. Every college that's open has had problems. My poor children are in college. I'm so upset. Um, they just sort of rolling the dice with all these kids, which is horrible. Um, so I don't like that. I don't like that. Um, and and um, we may have to lock down again. So there's, there's too much uncertainty for me to want to be invested heavily. But there's also plenty of things to buy. And I'm, I'll be excited to start buying things again. And even as we pare down every week that we don't spiral into a disaster, I don't mind buying something else. So we're just going to start picking up more of these bargain stocks for the portfolio. And, and by the way, the, the new hedge fund, the income producing hedge fund, only buys bargain stocks. We only buy stocks that aren't going to be affected by the virus. Um, very stably, middle of the road kind of stocks, you know, all weather things that we can sell options against. And uh, I think in two months, we're up over we're up over 10% already in two months, making 5% a month. I mean, it's crazy. So, you know, I mean, that's, that's, it's not like you have to invest in momentum stocks to make money. You can invest in nice, sensible stocks like the ones I'm talking about and make plenty of money. So why be risky? Why play games? It doesn't make any sense. Ben says, WBA, good dividend may come, may take over. Okay, I'll. Oh, I see. Okay, so Bernie. Bernie says good dividend may take on on Walgreens boots may take over 18 months to come back. Um, why not buy the stock? Can you review a position like this? I I reviewed WBA over and over and over again. I I think they're ridiculously underpriced. NYPD. What are you saying? I did something wrong or I did something right? Oh no, that's not it. I did say NYCB. It just it, for some reason it comes up NYCB PA. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> Robin says, isn't a lot of the market gain due to Trump using the treasuries to push it up for the election? Yeah, of course it is. It's, it's a bullshit market. They're, they're pumping money in all sorts of different ways. They are using to pump money into this market and to push things higher. And then now they're redoing the Dow. They're, they're actually changing the Dow to make it look better. The problem is that it can backfire and make it look worse because you put all these very high balance stocks into a into a price it's a price weighted index so in other words a dollar move in a stock brings the dow down at the moment 8.5 points now when they have more dollars in the dow then a single dollar move won't move it as much but right now the small number small dollar stocks in the dow don't move it at all um the the ones that move ten dollars a day have a big effect on the Dow. The ones that move a dollar a day, it's a $40 stock, a dollar could be two and a half percent, doesn't matter. It's still it's still only a dollar move and that and that has one tenth the effect of a, of a stock that moves $10, even if that $10 is, is only 2% of that stock, like Apple. Um, so it's, so you know, it's it's a very different system in measuring things and it doesn't work well when you have all these different size stocks and different breedings i think at some point it made it made sense back in the days when stocks were you know no stock was more than 20 or 30 bucks now we have these incredible discrepancies between the size of stocks which makes it now a much stupider index than it ever used to be um google is not going to buy tiktok oh well, that wasn't on my radar <laughs> That's some crazy stuff, huh? Google buying TikTok. Um, anybody buying TikTok, the whole thing we're doing with TikTok is incredible. It's, it's so weird. We are getting weirder and weirder as time goes by, folks. That's what's happening. So there's that, there's that, there's that. So are we still worried about the virus? Let's see. Let us see. Here's my calculator. You got to be smart about this stuff. So we got to write these things down. So we have 172,000 deaths in the U.S., don't even remember 172. <clears throat> Global cases, all right, 5.5 million. I can remember 5.5 million, 172, right? So global cases, 22,218. And drum roll, please. All right, what are we remembering? 5.5 million in the US and 172 deaths. And now we have. 
179, 7,000, oh, 6,500 people died since last week, and oh, 300,000 people got infected. <clears throat> That's not good. I, I, ah, okay, so minus 23,979. So that's 1.7 million more people were infected since last week. And that is now divided by 22,218 was last week's total. 8% growth. So there's 8% virus growth. And we have 350,000 new infections in the US. No, wait, it's five point, it was 5.5. 5. Sorry, it's 300,000. 300,000. New infections divided by five five million. Five point four percent. Look at that. We're below the world's average. Right? The global infections are growing at eight percent and we're growing at five point four percent. Very good. Good job not measuring. Excellent. <laughs> so deaths, now how did deaths do? Deaths were up from uh, what did we say? 172, right? It was 172.5, so deaths are uh, 6,500, yes, 6,500. Oh, 6,500 people died in the last seven days in America, and nobody cares, people. Bueller, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not funny, but it's horrifying, right? If you think about that, that we just accept this, 6,500 people died since last week. 300,000 got infected, 6,500 people died in the last week and we act like it doesn't matter. One, seven, two, five. 3.7, so 4% more people are dying, 5.4% more people are being infected. And we're doing better than the rest of the world. Okay, doing better than the rest of the world is not a good thing because it means the rest of the world's got serious problems. They're having a blowback in the virus and we still haven't clear, cured our first wave yet. And they're already getting into their second wave. You know, Fauci, if you remember Fauci, he used to appear on the Donald Trump show, but he got fired, he got canceled. Um, Fauci says this cold and flu season is going to be a total disaster. Of course, that's why Trump got rid of him, because you don't want you don't want to tell people that. But you're going to have the regular cold virus going around with the coronavirus. And you know how the, the doctor's offices during flu season is like packed with people. What is there? What is the plan? What's the plan at your doctor's office to keep you safe during the flu season with coronavirus? What's anybody's plan? What the hell are we going to do? I know. Let's send the kids to school. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, movie theater starts reopening in the U.S. There you go. See? Told you. IMAX. So, um, I'm still worried. Not going to change. Okay. I, 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 do, I do see that we have... Only 6,500 people died in a week. That's pretty good. We got lots of people. It's all right. So we're in good shape there. Only 6,500 people. That's, uh, you know, <laughs> good fortune in my town, but that's okay. Um, and we only had another 300,000 infections. Don't forget, China had 80,000 infections. And we considered that a catastrophe, but now we have 300,000 new infections in seven days, and that's okay. And globally, 23 million. I forget what the original number was, but it was like 22 or something like that, or I don't know. Two million more people, no, 10%, 7%, uh, whatever, 1.5, whatever, 1.5 million, whatever number of people. But of the world's infections in the last week, 20%, 25% are from the US. And and nobody's matching. I mean, look at Brazil's catching up to us on deaths, so though. That's interesting. Look at Mexico too. Wow. 
Wow. Here you go. Here's your Japanese. What are the four wor <laughs> what four countries in the world have the worst healthcare systems? Uh US, Brazil, Mexico, and India. Ding ding ding. You are right, sir. <laughs> it's like holy crap. So here's the rest of the world. You see signs of life around the rest of the world. We're in big trouble. Oh no, what happened? What are you doing? Come on. That's from last time. Really have to do that too. Uh, anyway, I'm a little concerned. Let's let's summarize and say really concerned. So I, I feel good about getting back to cash and staying mostly in cash. Still, trade suggestion needed. Oh, I don't worry about that. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, Robin says, isn't a lot. Oh, no, do that. Um, Clay says uh, about Corona. Don't forget that if you stop reporting cases, oh, yeah, don't forget that if you stop reporting cases, there are no cases. That's right. We are underreporting our cases now. That's our new plan. And, um, so no, it, it very likely doesn't only seem that we have a, a drop off in cases. There's no way to know. Um, how many actual coronavirus cases? Not corona. Be interesting if that's the thing. Coronavirus. See, they said that we're, we're dropping off significantly. Only 20, 20 people a day. Palm Beach County, my cases last 14 days. Oh, that's just like one place. Worldwide. Yikes. Now let's find the U.S. There we go. Okay, so there you are. 40,000 cases. That's 280. Yeah, that makes sense. That's what we saw. Two, two, basically, 30, well, 36,000. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, 40. I'm going to be down here. 36,000 down here. But you can have spikes in different days and whatever. Map of cases last 14 days. This is, uh, that's me right here. Uh, it's, as long as I stay away from there. Well, oh, that's our county, though. Total cases, 5,000. Total cases, 3,000. Miami, not good, 18,000. See how that is? It knows where I live, right? You know, it already has, oh, excuse me, it already has Florida all keyed up. 1,000 people died in my county. Holy cow. Wow. Isn't that weird? I don't know anybody who died. I know people who had it. I don't know anyone who died. Forecast suggests up to 9,600 will be reported in the week. Oh my God, what? August 21st, as of August, okay. Up to 9,600 new weekly deaths will be reported in the weekend. And these predict 187,000 total reported COVID deaths in the US. Ah, no way. That's ugly. Oh, up to, oh, that's your worst case scenario. Okay. You know, guys, come on guys, like let's not make the headline worse than it seems. So the national forecast, new weekly deaths. Well, that's pleasant. That's 5,000, so here's 5,000 a week. And the predictions go anywhere from there up to you know up, up and down here. Nobody nobody's going that low, frankly. It's really the errors are on the high side, unfortunately. And what's this side? Ensemble individual models. Don't know what that means. Total deaths. Well, that uh, yeah, obviously it's not going to go down. That's interesting. Nobody's predicting. Well, oh, oh, that's only for the month. Holy crap! That's, that's only for like the next month. Wow. Wow, that's some frightening stuff, huh? 
But anyway, okay, so I mean, here's the problem though. Look, these charts, the death chart is just going up linearly. These charts aren't really going down. They started going down a little bit, but they, they're basically kind of flattening and they're mostly predicted to have higher. Things are not that, and this is, this is the next two, three weeks, basically. And these aren't crazy. These are, these are blending. All these different studies are being blended to come up with this data. That's, that's the consensus of the finest forecasters that they have to do this stuff. So it's interesting stuff to look at. But, the, the, you know, I, I don't see how that really leads to such a robust market. But we're here. What are you going to do, though? The market keeps going up anyway. So we're just going to have to wait and see how it uh, plays out. But again, as I have said, when we were peering down the portfolios, I would rather see it play out and say, oh, no, I missed that rally. Just like I did in 1999. I will admit it. I, will, I was in 1999. I was telling people, this is crazy. Don't do it. Don't do it. You're going to get burned. And some of the people I told not to do it got burned very badly. Some of the people I told not to do it made a lot of money and got out. Possibly because I kept telling them how crazy it was and they should get out. But <laughs> I don't want to take, I don't want to try to take credit for it. They certainly had they had they listened to me in the first place, they never would have made the money. So some people like I told them that they didn't listen to me. They made a lot of money and then they listened to me and they got out, or or they just decided they made enough money. But I think at least there's something to that. To like you know, just sort of tell people to cash out at a certain point. The ones who totally didn't listen to me made a lot of money, then lost a lot more money, and. And again, this is not 1999, it's not a bubble, it's not undeserved, our leading stocks are leading for a reason, we have lagging stocks that are lagging for bad reasons. So there's definitely some way to be optimistic about this market and where it's going, but why not just buy the lagging stocks? Why not just buy the value stocks and ride those out through the crisis? And that way, if there is a further crisis, we have good stocks instead of, instead of having things that collapse on us. So, you know, that's, that's where I am in my thinking on this stuff. I want to be uh, a little bit more cautious. All right, so I'm going to wrap this up shortly because I have another meeting that I have to go to. Very important. And unfortunately, I could not make it any later than 2.30 today. So let's see, any other questions? And we'll talk about some general stuff. Tom says, I think if you just assume the new cases and deaths are at least the same or as bad as the week before Trump started messing around, they'd be fairly accurate. Well, that, that is pretty much what that chart does. It kind of takes, you know, here's, here's where Trump stopped testing. And here's what happened. But you see the projections haven't changed all that much. They're still trending more or less higher than where we were. Sorry, I don't think you're fooling these numbers. I don't think these graphs are being fooled. But we'll see. And of course, that's the CDC with their projections. But the problem with the CDC is they didn't, they don't, they don't have the data anymore. Nobody, nobody's giving them data anymore. Trump said, stop giving the CDC information. So I guess their guesses, their guesses are getting a little more like an extrapolation than anything else. And then the other thing we have to consider in the last 10 minutes of this thing is let's, let's consider what's happening in politics. Um, Biden had a really strong convention. Trump is having a, a good convention. Um, he's firming up his base. Um, he's pushing forward his narrative. And his narrative is basically like, yeah, but look at the economy. You know, I mean, that's, that's really his whole strategy. Like, he's basically, he's not excusing anything. Every single person who spoke on his behalf in the economy said, the economy, the economy, the economy, the economy, the economy. So we'll keep talking about. Um, and if you measure the economy as being the stock market, the economy is pretty strong. If you measure the economy in terms of how many people are unemployed and quality of life, quality of life, how can you freaking think your quality of life is better when you're not allowed out of your house? Or if you do go out of your house, now you have to wear a mask. I mean, how, how does anyone have any illusion whatsoever that we have a better quality of life now than we did four years ago? I wasn't wearing a mask four years ago and I could leave my house when I felt like it and I could hug my own mother. Wow. My, my children and my children for that matter. 
That was my life four years ago. Am I better off today than I was when Trump was elected? No. Do I have more money? Yeah, maybe I got more money, but I, I don't enjoy it. I'm not out. I'm not on vacation. I'm not in a plane. I can't go anywhere. I can't do anything. Disney's closed. The movies are closed. Restaurants are mostly closed. What the frick? I don't, I don't see the upside here. I really don't. I don't. I don't know why that's even a question. We're not better off. Money doesn't make you better off. If you can't spend it, what's the difference how much money you have? This is not an, this is not an enjoyable life, and it's not 100% Trump's fault. It's not even 80% Trump's fault, but it's a good, good 50% Trump's fault that it's his ban. He's a contributing factor. And is he going to fix it? Is he going to make it better? What if the second wave, what if we re-elect Trump and the second wave of the virus is worse and there's a complication or a mutation and the whole country has to take something really seriously and there's a complete emergency, who's going to be our leader then? Are you freaking kidding me? How is it even being considered that this guy could be re-elected? He should not even be in office now. You see, you know, they ask you that question, right? They always ask you that question when you talk about the president. It's like, oh, who do you want to be there at two in the morning? Who do you want to, who do you want answering the red phone at two in the morning when, when we're being attacked? Not Donald Trump. And we are being attacked. We're being attacked by a virus. He's doing nothing. He's terrible. What if the virus is Russia? We are being attacked by Russia and we're being cyber attacked by Russia. But what if, what, what if the virus is Russia? What if the virus is anything? He's obviously incapable of mounting a response. He has shown us that. And this is not about campaigning against Donald Trump or for Joe Biden or whatever. This is about, oh my God, are you kidding me? Are you seriously going to let this man lead the country for four more years? How is that even a thing? Yet, yet these polls have like 40% support for this guy. I do not understand the 40%. I don't. I really don't. Okay, I understand 20% of the country are idiots and will, and will support whoever they support no matter what. I get that. But the 20% of the 40%, the half of the 40% that support Donald Trump and want four more years of this, I don't get that. I don't care how much money you're making. I don't get that. Something's got to change. And now you got to think from a market perspective, something's got to change. I don't see how four more years of this is good for anything. I cannot make enough money in four years to offset what I'm worried about is going to happen over the next four years. So we have got to take things seriously and we are probably going to have some drastic changes and given that we're going to have some drastic changes, then we have to consider the repercussions, the market repercussions of, oh, I did close it. Um, we have to consider the market repercussions of what it's going to look like when Joe Biden is president. If, he, if he's not president, I can't even imagine what's going to happen in this country. But if he is president, what's going to happen in this country? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Well, what happens to these markets? What are they going to look like? Are we still going to be going up like this? No. He's going to reinstate corporate taxes. He's going to reinstate personal taxes. He already told people if you own 400000 a year or less, you're not going to get touched. That means he's going to really be touching the people who earn more. So we're going to see some big changes there, corporate tax changes, things like that. A lot of the stuff that Trump did since here, is going to be reversed as far as taxation on companies. And the problem is that when you went up from, from 5,000 in January of 2017 to 12,000, now probably 8,000 isn't even getting back to normal. Same thing here, 2,000. 20, all right, sorry, 20, let's, let's, yeah, 2,200, 2,200. Now we're at 34. That's another thousand. That's 50%. Okay. 
realistically 20, 25% would be a lot. We're at 50%, so you, you can take half of this gain out. So probably here, which is which is back to our 2850 line. I mean, basically that's where we should be, 2850. That's where, that's where we've been using this chart since here. We predicted 2850 would be the top of the market and nothing has really changed our mind about that. 20, not the top, I'm sorry, it's a must hold line. The must hold line means that's a break point between the high and the low. And you don't expect to move of much more than 10% past that line. So 2,800 plus another 280, you're into about 3,000. So 3,000 should be the top of the S&P, not 3,500. Same thing for the NASDAQ. NASDAQ should be, you know, well, basically it should all be around these lines, like 8,000 line. Um, the Dow probably, ugh, that's crazy too. The Dow went from 16, 24 maybe on the Dow, maybe. That's 50% of even from 16. It could be lower, like 22 but nowhere near here. We are gonna have a correction. Even if the economy was good, even if we didn't have these problems, we would still have a correction. So we're, we're gonna have a correction. The question is when, but, and again, we made 100% in our long-term portfolio this year. Why mess around with it? Like, let's keep the cash get on the sidelines, we'll still pick up some nice new, some nice companies. We didn't take all the stuff out of the long-term portfolio either, but we'll pick up some nice companies and we will then ride out the storm. If there is a storm, if there's no storm, we'll just move along with the regular companies. Make, and instead, maybe we won't make, uh, maybe we won't make 40% next year. Maybe we won't make 100, we made 100% already this year. Maybe next year we'll only make 20%, maybe only 30%, but you know what? It's growth. And then we'll catch the next cycle some other time. But you know, when you make 100% in a year, if you don't shut that down and take the money, you, you're doing it wrong, believe me. All right, I gotta go, I gotta run on this meeting. Thank you all for coming, we will do it again next week. Let's see if there's any more questions right before we go. Uh, no more questions, fantastic, great job guys. <laughs> all right, have a nice day.